rumble of a jiggling microphone. Some interesting meteorological phenomenon this week. Raise your hands if you saw it at night. Northern Lights. There was another Northern Light uh, display that everyone, uh, a lot of people were talking about. And go figure, I met someone that I knew on the trail uh, this week, and uh, this person lives around Mount Hood, and uh, he said he woke up at around 3 a.m., and he went out to around Lolo Pass there on the west side of the mountain, and he said he was looking, and he was hoping to see it, and he was about to kind of give up, and then uh, uh, just before that, a, a shower curtain of purple rained down. He said it was, it, it was, it was like, almost like liquid. <laughs> it's like a shimmering curtain of uh, the northern lights, auroras, aurora borealis. And it was just uh, a beautiful phenomenon. And I had a couple, a uh, couple pictures of that, yeah. This, these are not my pictures. Uh, pulled them off the internet, so I hope the artist will forgive me <laughs> uh, the, uh, for, for using them. But I googled uh, recent Northern Lights there, and then that's, uh, that's Mount Hood. And Tri uh, Vista House there. And then the next one is Trillium Lake and I'm not sure how much those colors are blown out. You don't, you, I'm not sure about that, but all over the United States, my hearing is so bad, Roger. If you speak, I won't be able to hear you. So I'm sorry. Uh, I see your hand, I wanna acknowledge that, but I'm, my hearing's bad, I'm sorry. Um, but all over the United States, from East Coast, even over in Europe, uh, my friend in Amsterdam was posting this, this storm that they saw, and then from the East Coast to the Midwest, and then, is it gonna make it to Oregon? And it made it to Oregon. And so I was just kind of reveling in that, uh, that event. I did not see it. I knew about it, and I figured, well, sleep is a little bit more important to me. <laughs> but for our opening prayer, it has to do with seeing in the dark and, and embracing the dark, whether it's phys physical darkness, whether it may be darkness in life that we pass through in life. And I came upon, uh, upon this opening prayer and I thought that it matched well with what happened this week in the dark. And perhaps Spirit wants to use this to speak to you today. May this be our opening prayer for meeting. Glory be to you, O God of the night, for the whiteness of the moon and the infinite stretches of dark space. Let me be learning, let me be learning to love the night as I know and love the day. Let me be learning to trust its darkness and to seek its subtle blessings. Let me be learning the night's way of seeing that in all things I may trace the mystery of your presence. And so those prayers are written by Philip Newell, Celtic prayers, and a little archaic way of of phrasing that, but still appreciate that approach of learning to love all seasons in all times in our life. May we take a moment to center down, friends. God of light and darkness, we welcome you. 
into this space as we encounter you in one another, as we encounter you within, as we encounter you in this time of service, and deeply as we encounter you in the silence. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. 
Good morning. I'm going to be reading out of 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, 12 through 14, and then finally 26 through 27. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. For just as the body is in one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are in one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then finally, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Have a nice Sunday. Brenna was double booked today. And I said, oh, well, I guess we got to get somebody else to do the reading. And she said, Dad, this is the 21st century. Let me pre-record it, and then we'll show it. And I said, you're a genius. <laughs> I know that Brenna is here in spirit. I hope so. I hope there's some channeling going on here. Some attunement, inspiration. Um, I want to introduce to you uh, my good friend Gil. Gil is here uh, four or five days a week. We share office space there. Uh, in the office and Gil I have to be careful uh, by stepping into your office because we end up in really good conversations about the present state of Quakerism we get into really good conversations about the present state of the church theology the Bible chili recipes I'm afraid to go head to head with, with Gil, with my chili recipes. But Gil, it's always a pleasure to be around you. When I moved here, um, people were like discovering that I moved to the West Coast for a year. They said, you live in Portland now? And I said, yeah, we've lived here for about a year. Within the first few weeks that I had moved here, uh, Gil and I actually went to school together, took a, had a class together with Wes Daniels at George Fox Seminary. And so Gil and I got to know each other. And when I moved out here, uh, Gil, you sought me out when I was here and still getting used to living here. That meant a lot to me. Who seeks you out? instead of you waiting to invite yourself. Who is it that seeks you out? Gil, you sought me out. You took me out to lunch, and we had a great time uh, of conversation. And it was just the beginning, again, of kind of a, a revisitation of our journey and friendship. Gil is uh, a leader there in FWCC, Friends World Committee for Consultation, and uh, anything, uh, all things and everything uh, globally Quaker, 
He is a great person to talk to. And Gil, we are so proud and honored to have you not only uh, have your office space here and to have you among us, but to bring today's message. And may Christ uh, speak to our condition. Welcome, Gil. Come. All right, one of the benefits of a theater major is I only need the microphone so that the folks on Zoom can hear me. It's wonderful to be here and to see some of you who I have seen before um, and to see some new faces as well. So my name, oh, we're getting some slides up here. But one of the, there we go. All right, so the 2024 World Plenary was held in Vanderbilt Park, South Africa, which is just outside of the city of Johannesburg. Um, and Johannesburg is also where the Apartheid Museum is, and I highly recommend a visit there if you are ever in Johannesburg. I'm going to say that we also have another person who attended the World Plenary here, and that's Meg Cody from Multnomah Monthly Meeting. So Meg can fact check me if, uh, if you're like, did that really happen? Yet yeah, Meg will let you know. So some things of interest about this, this was the first hybrid World Plenary. Um, held by FWCC, and it was a great honor to be part of the team who planned and implemented this historic conference. So next slide. So I'm Gil George. I'm the operations manager for FWCC section of the Americas, and uh, also the clerk of elders at West Hills Friends. And along with me is Noodle the Lemur, who was our morale assistant for the conference. And my connection back to my 12-year-old. So we met in a hotel called the Riverside Sun and on Zoom. So next slide. We had 500 Quakers gathered in person and online for seven days to discern the spirits leading in three thematic streams. And coming very soon is going to be a documentary film of the experience. Um, and so the documentary filmmakers put together a short video for World Quaker Day, which was last Sunday. Um, and we're gonna pull that up now and take a quick look. And included in this will be the Young Adult Friends Epistle excerpts, the Epistle, and the Tapestry document weaving the three themes together. Donde quiera que esté, puedo mirar diferentes estrellas, pero cuando miro hacia abajo, estoy entre amigos. To all friends everywhere, we send loving greetings from the Friends World Committee for Consultation World Plenary held August 5th to 12th, 2024, online and in Vanderbilt Park near Johannesburg, South Africa. 500 friends have gathered at the river's edge and online, coming from 53 countries and representing 95 yearly meetings, worship groups, and Quaker organizations. Our theme is living the spirit of Ubuntu, responding with hope to God's call to cherish creation and one another. Ubuntu is a Zulu word that speaks to the power and ceaseless work of the Holy Spirit between us, enabling us to go beyond our individual selves and grasp that I am because we are. Prior to this gathering, 46 of the young adult friends among us came together for four days of shared experience, conversation, reflection, laughter, worship, and song. We were warmly and joyously welcomed by a host from Southern Africa Yili Meeting and the Africa section of FWCC. We each have differences in how we express spirituality, in our views about the world, 
our ability and disability, and our experience of gender and sexuality, but we have been able to connect all the same. In our discernment together, we have felt the spirit move among us. Even as we have been imperfect vessels, in these challenging moments, we have learned that we can find an equal place at the table without needing to adopt the same identity. We have sought to discern spirit-led ways forward to honor our commitment to our three interconnected themes, care of creation, the healing of relationships in the light of historic and ongoing injustice, and nurturing Ubuntu. Our emerging concerns have been captured and woven together in a tapestry document. We recognize that our three themes of Ubuntu and community, care for creation, and repairing historical and ongoing injustice are intertwined and inseparable. The spirit of Ubuntu, the power of community, can also drive us to dig deep into the pain and trauma of the world, to face up to climate crisis and the ongoing effects of historical injustice. In expanding our sense of the divine and our understanding of Ubuntu, we can say, I am because you are, and because creation is. We grieve with God for the exponential impact of historical and ongoing injustice. Healing begins with sharing our stories, telling the truth, and listening deeply. God of love and grace, we are a beautiful and broken people, living in a beautiful and broken world. We confess that we have fallen short in caring for each other and for creation. As a faith community, we ask you to forgive us for neglecting creation and for inflicting grave injustices upon one another. Give us the courage and wisdom to move forward boldly. Grant us the strength to seek each other's forgiveness and the love and courage to hold both pain and possibility in our hearts. We ask you to send us on a new journey with our fellow humans and all your creatures in the spirit of Ubuntu. Amen. So our three themes were care of creation, healing and repairing relationships in light of historic and continuing injustice, and Ubuntu. And part of our work on this was that our sessions were all in three languages, um, English, Spanish, and Kiswahili. And one of the things our interpreters team had some signs, slow down, <laughs> pause, repeat. And they were used extensively throughout. In the Americas, all of our work is done in both English and in Spanish. And we've had to learn this lesson to slow down, to pause, and to repeat so that our words can be heard, translated, and understood. I think these translation principles also translate very well into Quaker experience and expression. Our times together are full of pauses. The third stream is Ubuntu. And while the other streams are fairly self-explanatory, I wanted to go into this because Ubuntu is what tied the streams together and is a worldview I think we need to examine closely as we continue to be market segmented and algorithmed into ever smaller spheres of disconnection. So what, do, <clears throat> what does Ubuntu mean? It's not just a computer operating system. Based on discussion at the last in-person sessions of Southern Africa yearly meeting, a short introduction for participants in the World Plenary Meeting was prepared, and it talked about how the term Ubuntu 
is the deeply held belief, morality, and custom that every person is worthy of being recognized, respected, and heard, and that we as human beings are all interdependent. Going back to our passage in 1 Corinthians that we heard earlier. Ubuntu is found as a daily practice in many African societies, though terms, languages, and nuances may differ. The effect of Ubuntu is to maintain cohesion, balance, openness, peace, compassion, and dignity in a community. It restrains self-serving materialism, and it ensures that strangers are welcome. It also implies a collective responsibility on all our parts to ensure that all members of a community have the means of subsistence and learning, of participation in communal decision making and in access to rites of passage. Elders have a responsibility to resolve conflicts. Ubuntu further extends into care for the environment since we are part of this creation, part of this beautiful God-given whole that we got to see some amazing images of earlier. We are part of an interdependent whole with creation. The priority for humanity expressed as Ubuntu is an ancient wisdom. It's found in our scriptures it's found in African cultures, it's found in Asian cultures, it's found in South American cultures, it's been around for a while. It's been asserted in more recent times in the process of liberation from colonialism and apartheid in South Africa and the Christian anti-apartheid leader Desmond Tutu explained Ubuntu with the words, my humanity is caught up in, is inextricably bound up in yours. My humanity is bound up in yours. doesn't matter if we agree on which candidate we're going to vote for. It doesn't matter if my skin color is probably lighter than most people's. It doesn't matter what my social class is and your social class is. My humanity is bound up in yours. And Ubuntu is now being taken up in law in South Africa, Uganda, and Lesotho. The four principles of Ubuntu can be considered as community, interdependence, solidarity, and dignity. Ubuntu resonates with the Quaker belief that we are all equal, that we all have equal access to the divine voice, our duty to care for one another was expressed by Isaac Pennington in 1667. Our life is love and peace and tenderness and bearing with one another and forgiving one another and not laying accusations against one another, but praying for one another and helping one another up with a tender hand. There's an understanding that I am not always on top of the social pyramid. There's an understanding that the social pyramid is itself a construct, one that we as friends can step outside of and live in power, the power of Christ. A number of biblical passages have been found to be relevant to this concept, including 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we read earlier. And in seeking to apply Ubuntu, Southern African friends are looking beyond the spiritual because it is beyond the spiritual. Engaging in activities like 
working towards a universal basic income grant, clean energy production, food security, alternatives to violence, and overcoming and forgiving past atrocities. And let me tell you, that time in the Apartheid Museum was eye-opening and painful. When we forget that my humanity is bound up in yours, it's very easy to cause great harm. So many of you may be wondering, what was it actually like to be there at this gathering? So this is the part where we're stepping out of the sermon and more into a trip report. You might want to know whether I found the event to be worth the effort, the energy, the plane fare, the other costs. And I'll say that it was not perfect because anytime we gather together as human beings, both our positives and our negatives are magnified. You might have noticed this happen a couple times in the past. But there was a deep beauty that surfaced in the sea of uncertainty in which we met. So here is a list of words that express my experience of the 2024 world plenary. Stressful. <laughs> The main difference for me was that I ended up being the tech lead for this event. Um, so my stress level was probably a tiny bit higher than everybody else's there, um, especially when day two rolled around. And we found out that um, accidentally putting a surge protector underneath a heating vent is not a good idea. Um, we ended up having a surge protector become a Roman candle. <laughs> um, thankfully, the head of our interpreter team is a volunteer firefighter, and things were under control quickly. Um, but yeah, I was really glad that I pushed for all of the redundancies I pushed for in the planning part of things. Um, our on our in-country tech team who we had hired to do this actually had us back up and running in less than 45 minutes. And that's after losing the audio computer, the video computer, um, a camera, and an HDMI switch. So that was a tiny bit on the stressful side. But it was also joyful. There was such a sense of joy that this event was able to happen in Africa which, um, if you don't know, is actual, actually holds the more Quakers live in Africa than in the rest of the globe combined. And that's just Kenya. When you throw the rest of Africa in, it gets even more. Um, so our hosts were so happy to be able to have us there with them. And the meeting of many old and new friends was incredibly beautiful. It was challenging. We were talking about some of the largest issues currently facing humanity and our role in causing and repairing them. And I personally was deeply challenged in many areas in my life. So it was deepening. Those challenges led me to look deeper into what my callings in these three areas are and to examine some long neglected pieces of my life. It was social. There was a ton of hangout time and time for interpersonal connection. Like nobody ever sat at the same tables at lunches or dinners or meal times. People were meeting different people. We had I feel sorry for our interpreter team because they pretty much didn't get a break. They were always interpreting during downtimes, during conversation times, but you could tell they were also enjoying themselves quite a bit. Um, 
It was cordial. For the most part, there was a deep sense of hospitality extended to each other. But it was also tense. Because there are differences among friends. It was cordial as long as you weren't too open about LGBTQ plus identities. Um, it was cordial if we didn't get into some of the inherent racism in some of the ways we've operated in the past. While there was some tolerance, especially for European friends, it was obvious that our friends from the non-European global south could not always safely express their true feelings on matters. That it was actually unsafe for them to do so. That it would have social consequences when they returned home. This especially runs for LGBTQ plus identities, but even among European friends attending, there was discussion about safety of certain identities. Even in Britain Yearly Meeting, there is disagreement and rejection for members who might express different gender identities. So when you look at the racial history of discrimination in the world, when you look at current discussions going across the world, there were tensions boiling underneath the surface that occasionally popped up. And, you know, if you want the tea from any Quaker meeting, look at the young adult friend's epistle. Like, that's what, they name it, no problem. You want, you want the gossip, you want to know what was really happening, take a look at the young adult friend's epistle. And so what came out of everything felt a bit ambiguous. If you've read the epistle in the weaving document, you can catch that this was an unsettled meeting. And I want to say something here. Just because it's unsettled is not a bad thing. It's good to be unsettled in the face of injustice in the face of human suffering. It's good to be unsettled, and that is a spirit-led action. The tension and pain of the world around us was deeply felt, even as a friend zoomed in from his house arrest for refusing to serve in the military in Ukraine, and it's reflected in the documents we produced. So on the screen, I have a few key excerpts from the epistle that I think highlight some of these feelings I perceived. We have all been challenged to find a spirit-led balance between speaking and listening, between action and contemplation, between doing and simply being. We are seized with the urgent need to do transformative work in the world. We are learning to expand our compassion for who we are, just as we find ourselves in all our brokenness and beauty. The variants in our perspectives, some large, some small, have become more apparent at times painfully so. We have been able, with God's blessing, to resolve some tension through compassionate conversation, while some was simply held in our midst. We are not discouraged. We are not discouraged. We are constantly bombarded from Pick your media stream of choice. With messages saying, there's no hope. With messages saying, fear. 
And it's really hard to listen to the still small voice that says, I am hope. Fear not, I am with you. If anything comes out of this, friends, it is that we are not discouraged, that we will not choose fear. That, as Paul says in Romans, that there is nothing, nothing, no action of mine, no action of the world's that can separate us from the source of love in the universe. Nothing can separate us. So out of all the items to come from our listening, the prayer at the end of the weaving document of the three streams holds the most life and truth for me. I think that this is the call to action appropriate to the immense diversity of experience at the World Plenary, at the immense diversity of experience in this room, on this planet. So after I read the prayer, we'll enter into open worship, and it will remain up on the slide for the first few minutes. So friends, let us pray together. And I invite you to speak this with me, if you so desire. And then we will enter into our time of communion with God and each other. God of love and grace, we are a beautiful and broken people living in a beautiful and broken world. We confess that we have fallen short in caring for each other and for creation. As a faith community, we ask you to forgive us for neglecting creation and for inflicting grave injustices on each other. Give us the courage and wisdom to move forward boldly. Grant us the strength to seek each other's forgiveness and the love and courage to hold both pain and possibility in our hearts. We ask you to send us on a new journey with our fellow humans and all your creatures in the spirit of Ubuntu. Amen.